Baltic Way. Why I choose this topic? Um, because, um, first of all, it's something that makes me proud of my nation. Uh, it's something that inspires me a lot. And uh, I remember one, one conversation with one of my classmates. He said, I really don't understand when, why we have to uh, study all those cases from Colombia, Brazil, China, because they don't make sense for me. Because we have different problems, and, uh, and, and that's why we need different solutions. I totally agree that uh, we can't take something uh, from another country and then make some small innovations and then implement in, uh, in our own countries. That's why I'm here to get inspiration, uh, and that's it, not more. <laughs> to make my own system which, uh, which works in my country. And this is, uh, yeah, as I mentioned already, this is my um, story of my inspiration. Maybe that's why I'm working for public administration, because I was raised after that time when we became uh, independent. I don't remember much from that time, but it definitely influenced me as a person very much and my value system very much. Uh, the other thing when, why I choose this topic is uh, I think it's a, I, I called it as example of peaceful political transition, but I think it's um, extraordinary example of collaboration as well. And when I um, think about Maxwell, I think it will be always in my head this term collaboration, because in all courses, in all workshops, that's, that's the most uh, popular word that we mentioned, collaboration. And it's very, very important. But before I start to speak about uh, this event, I, I will a little bit uh, introduce, with the, introduce you with the background. And it starts all in 1939, um, when there was signed agreement between two big nations, Germany and Russia, at that, mo at that point already Soviet Union. And you can see that even in the New York Times, they wrote that there is sign a 10 years non-aggression pact. Actually, we all know that after one week, the World War II uh, started. And this uh, agreement had secret protocols. And in those secret protocols, they divided the power and the influence in uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, in that kind of countries like Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, and Romania. Um, it means for Baltic states, for those three states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, that uh, actually we became a part of uh, Soviet Union. The official propaganda at, time, at that time was that it was our voluntary choice. Uh, and definitely Soviet Union, um, didn't say in public that there were some kind of uh, agreements regarding this, and they denied it, those facts. Um, in the 80s, people in Baltic states became more and more active. They wanted to express their ideas. They wanted to become an independent countries. Um, they wanted to feel how it is to live in the freedom. and. Uh, then, then in 15 years later, 1989, uh, we had this extraordinary event called Baltic Way, Way when two million people went in the streets, on the road, and just uh, stayed there uh, in the hands to express their ideas in, actually in the silence. And this was, the goal of this event was uh, to get international attention, to get fair evaluation of the past events, and of course, to get freedom. But uh, of course, this was not the first event when we came in the streets and so on, but this was definitely one of the peak mo uh, moments in all this. And uh, as I mentioned, those were two million people from all Baltic states. It's approximately 30% of all population. It's very, very big number of people. And uh, various people, from newborns to elder people, I would say four generations were on the streets. 
uh, from different nationalities, which is very, very important issue in our country because now we are not so united with people who came in our country um, uh, in the time of Soviet Union. We have, I would say, we still have uh, issues regarding integration, but at that point we were very united. And there, in the streets, were not only Latvians, uh, Lithuanians, and Estonians. There were people from Russia, Belarus, uh, Ukraine, and all the other countries. Um, it was a 600 kilometers people chain, uninterrupted, even in those um, regions where, where the population is not so high. Uh, people uh, hold the hands from Tallinn, which is the uh, capital city of uh, Estonia, through Riga, the Vilnius, which is capital city of Lithuania. And it was organized by the national independence movements, which is actually very, very challenging. It was very, very challenging at that time because there were no mobile phones, no social media. Um, TV, radio was controlled by Soviet Union and their censorship. And that's why it's, and the second challenge was that at that point, families didn't have cars, actually. Or those families who have cars, they were quite wealthy, and I would say very loyal to that, uh, to that governance that we had. Uh, that's why there was a problem with transportation as well. And uh, it, it, it's not like in democracy that uh, you are not satisfied with something. You go on the street, you express your ideas, then you go home, maybe, exchange those ideas with your family and everything is okay. It was very, very brave action for those people. They used symbolic, which was actually not, uh, but which was actually forbidden. They used the uh, flags of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. But at that time, during the Soviet Union, uh, we had different flags. And those flags that we had before, it was forbidden symbolic. And there you can see on the map, how the road looked like, and 600 kilometers uh, or 400 miles, it's really long distance, is like a distance from Los Angeles to San Francisco, from Syracuse to Quebec, something like this, uh, which was organized, and all people in the same time at 7 p.m. just went on the road. Uh, what we achieved with this, uh, with this action, definitely a lot of international attention. In all biggest uh, newspapers of Western world, there was not only stories about this event, but stories about the past, uh, what actually happened before Second World War, uh, what happened after. It was um, educational work, I would say, for the Western, uh, Western society as well. Um, and the other thing which is very, very meaningful for us that the Soviet Union acknowledged that there was that kind of act, there was that kind of agreement, and that, uh, that kind of activities gave us a lot of opportunities to go through all those processes to get uh, an independent country and help us a lot. Um, as I mentioned, this was uh, nonviolent resistance. We didn't have guns or something like this. Um, we went only with our ideas. And uh, to express those ideas, we used a lot of our songs, traditions, and so on. That, was, that were the things that um, actually helped us all through all the, all the time, through all those years. And, um, that's helped us to understand and don't forget where come we from, who we are, and uh, to give the traditions to other, the next generation. And um, even if uh, during our, uh, during those years when we became independent country, all was not only about uh, nonviolence. There were periods when the uh, special forces attacked to the government organizations and so on, 
even then government called all the people, but they called for nonviolent reasons to build barricades to protect those uh, uh, possible targets, which were like strategic objects like TV, radio, governmental organization. For example, this building is cabinet of ministers, the building where I work at the moment. And uh, you see how we protected this. It's, it looks like silly, really silly. <laughs> with cars and all those people, they are just like this. In January, they stayed there for two weeks. And generally in Latvia, it's the same as January in Syracuse, really cold. But they believed that that's what they are doing. And they didn't uh, complain that there are not good conditions. Um, they have stayed there. And def definitely songs and this um, cultural thing uh, uh, helped us to be united in th that kind of periods as well. And that's why I wanted to show a little bit more about uh, what helped us to be that we, that we were through all those years. We have some very nice events that we are doing still. And, and, and for example, some of the countries like Israel, they are telling that for them it's like a duty for each person to become a soldier for a while. I think for us it's like a not written duty to be a dancer or to be a singer for a while. And when at that period in the, uh, in the end of 80s, in the beginning of 90s, 
we had this independence movement, and now I will say every five years we have this um, song and dance festival, and then it's like some kind of movement. It's like your honor thing that you are participating in those things and that you are one of those many peoples. Um, that's the education which is very strong still, this cultural education, and that's the that's the way I would say how we build the value system of children in our country still. But uh, even if I was born in 80s and um, my childhood was in this transition period, uh, I was a dancer as well. I danced traditional Latvian dances eight years. And uh, that's why I'm saying it was still in that period uh, in Soviet, during the Soviet time, even then those traditions were very, very strong and it helps to build that kind of society who is ready to go out on the streets and say, that is our dream, that's what we want. And, uh, and that kind of movements definitely help to be united for all society, that's for sure. <coughs> and one more thing which is very, 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 um, I would say, heuristic, uh, like characters, us as a nation, we remember always all those things. We remember our past, we speak about this. Um, the biggest events we had when the Baltic Way had 25 years, uh, but even each year we have some kind of small activities, even like this, we made uh, the road from the candles, the road where we stand as a people <laughs> chain, uh, we make a lot of uh, sport activities, uh, and we still remember this road and what this, what these activities made for us. That we can live in that kind of country where we can express our ideas, where we can complain about that we don't like, uh, do it easily, and participate to make uh, the country greater and brighter future for our children. Um, that's the thing that sometimes is, uh, when we speak about ourselves, that we look too much in the past, maybe. I would say that maybe we are not so strong to, um, to plan the future. We, in the beginning, it was very easy. Our goals were to become uh, members of the European Union, to become a members of NATO. It was easy. Now we are in that kind of stage that I sometimes feel that we don't know what to do. What is the next, what will be the next step? Um, and that was my short story. Even Google remember our, 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 our events. Thank you. You know, we are very good in this to reorganize all the things. And actually, we were very good uh, in this to, like, even those things which are not so bad, we threw them all away and made everything from the scratch, like from the beginning. 
we were so frustrated about all that happened that we couldn't live with those things. Even some kind of celebrations, like somebody asked me if uh, we celebrate March 8, you know? It was a very, very popular day during the Soviet time. It's a uh, day of women. When, during, when we became independent, we definitely don't celebrate that kind of thing. Now it became popular again. <laughs> Now we, we de developed our personality and we can live with some kind of things which come from that period. But definitely we, we reorganized everything. Still a big issue in our country is regarding those people who were um, um, report, report about other people. You know, in that system there were a lot of people who worked in universities, uh, who, were involved, uh, who were intelligent people but who actually reported about the colleagues. And still those lists of, the peop of those people are a secret. We can't still open it. We are still not ready for this. Because a lot of those people actually are still in the positions. You know? Even if you reorganize uh, the, the organizations and so on, there are still, you know, that kind of connections are very, very strong between those people and that kind of networks. And there are people who are very good in this, uh, that you can be um, in good position in that uh, system, and you can be uh, in good position in, in this system, and you can be loyal for both systems. And that's still our issue, what we are doing with those lists, with those people. Uh, but uh, definitely when we speak about uh, governmental organizations, then you can see that a lot of things change, and that's why uh, there are a lot of young people inside government. For example, when I started to work in government uh, 10 years ago, it was, I was fresh after university, and I worked in Ministry of Justice, and there were all my study mates. <laughs> it was like this. Because we had a new, um, new process regarding administrative law. We were the like, first generation who came with that kind of knowledge. And it was easy for us to get in the governmental organization. And uh, it, it was easy because of the language knowledge as well. Because we, were, we wanted to become as a part of the European Union. And those people who worked maybe, I don't know, in 80s or something like this, they didn't have knowledge of English. And um, they weren't interested to get maybe that kind of knowledge as well and skills. That's why a um, lot of things just happen. Thing that definitely um, uh, felt all of us in our lives, when the Soviet Union came, there was, uh, during the Soviet Union, there was no properties. Um, then a lot of, uh, then uh, when they came, they just took the property from the people. That's what we get in 90s, we get it all back. Like soil, houses. The problem is sometimes that the next generations are not so organized to do all with those big properties, you know? <laughs> to live with all this, uh, that's a big responsibility. That's not only something like benefit. You, can, you have to invest a lot of money because during those 50 years, nobody invested money in, in, your, in those properties. There just live many, many people. And um, it, some of those houses look very, very sad, even now. That's the thing that we felt, all of us, that we have no property, we have no freedom, we are different. And that's, that's more about everyday life. You know, when sometimes uh, change in the governmental level, some of the people don't care about that kind of thing because they don't feel the influence on, on their own lives. Yes. Uh, I've read some of about marvelous But I've also read that afterwards it moved very quickly to a kind of a militarized emphasis, emphasis 
And I wonder how much of the, of the nonviolent aspect of it continues to be not only celebrated, but, but um, given some emphasis uh, rather than uh, it seems to be a rather swift movement towards uh, methods of self military. There was definitely emphasis on nonviolence. Um, of as I mentioned, in this barricade time when we had in the January, there were some people who died, but it's not like a number of, uh, huge number of people. Every person counts, um, but it's uh, less than 20 people. Of course, we are a small na nation, but it's um, definitely, we still believe that it was nonviolent <coughs> transition. There was not so not so painful, and uh, all those things um, actually you could feel if you live live uh, in the capital city. But for example, I grew up in countryside, and it was like I still remember this time as a sun, uh, sunny time, you know, like child, and I. I can't tell that I raised up in wartime or something like this. Definitely no. I didn't feel, feel anything from this. Yes. Did the songs change? Did yes. Did use protest songs? Um, um, there, are, there was some kind of censorship, of course, regarding the songs. But you know, sometimes people are very good to cover, yeah. but they are very good in their job as well. <laughs> but, there is, but definitely, you know, but through dance it's easier. Right. <laughs> there you can't see everything uh, so directly. With songs there was censorship, definitely. Even if you like um, ordinary person, you read the song and you can't see anything in this song. Mm -hmm. But this uh, event, it was still in, during the Soviet time as well. So when you say dance was easier, people, well, what did people do to embed protest in the dancing? I think it's more about identity, that we show that we have our own identity, that we are nothing that, you know, Soviet Union had common values, um, some kind of, I would say, common, um, um, even gestures that, that are used in dance and so on, which are more Slavic. But uh, none of Baltic uh, states aren't like Slavic countries. And we still use only those things that are only traditional to our culture. We didn't. Uh, implement some kind of, you know, small motives or something like this. It's the easiest way how you can ruin your traditions. Mm -hmm. You start with some small things from other traditions which are not familiar, not even close to your, and it becomes actually another thing. Mm -hmm. And you can present it as, you see, you still dance Latvian dances. Yeah. Right. But we, it was clean, still clean, with all those Latvian costumes and so on. Yes. There is like uh, still like a whole agency, governmental agency, who work for that because it's every five years there is like for adults this festival, and then every five years for children, for youths, and it's really that uh, when one festival ends the preparation for the next one starts, because all those five years you have to learn the new dances, the new program, you have to create it, you have to discuss it, and so on, and, and, and yeah, it's long preparation. Celebration of, um, of the, the traditions. 
I would say that there is no conflict in general, because even now in uh, in uh, in those um, in this festival, it's there is this big event that you saw in the end, like one day, but it's not like one day event. It's an event which is like one week. And there are uh, possibility to present your culture to other nationalities as well in smaller events. Some kind of small, small pieces in the big event as well. Um, I would say there is no conflict. The conflict is then, at least for me personally, the conflict is then when the person lives there, the person was born there, but the person doesn't speak in that language that we use. That's personally, for me, there is a conflict. Does that happen? Yes. <clears throat> that people who, who live in that country, they don't understand even that language because they don't feel <coughs> the need to, to, to learn that kind of language. And maybe it's sometimes a little bit, you know, when you come from a bigger nation, you have more power. <coughs> And a lot of people understand you. People who came from small nations, they have always this need to learn other languages <laughs> because nobody else understands you. <laughs> They go to their own schools. They can go to Latvian schools. The Russian schools are, um, are paid by government, Latvian government. And this is the only one schools of minor minority which are paid by Latvian government. Because it's a little bit, I would say, tricky to say that it's minority if it's like um, 30, more than 30% of the population, and in Riga even more. Uh, and but uh, the thing that uh, was reformed in the last I don't know 20 years, that uh, even if you are a student in Russian school, you learn some kind of courses in Latvian. It's not like Latvian is only like your foreign language, like English or French. <laughs> but uh, that some of the courses are in Latvian, and with each year becomes more and more. That's why I would say there, for younger generation, I thought actually that there is not a problem for them to speak Latvian, but then I met some people who can still survive with Russian, and even if they, it's not that they don't speak because they are shy, but they really don't understand what I'm saying. And it's then a little bit sad. And then it's difficult to integrate. Yeah. Mm. So like Russian uh, kids studied Latvian and uh, like the new generation, are the new generations in Latvia learning Russian, for example? Mm -hmm. I speak Russian. I'm Latvian. I came from very Latvian town where, where even Russians speak Latvian, yeah. <laughs> That's why in my environment there was no Russian, but I, I speak Russian. I, I, it's okay for me. I am, but uh, with younger generation, it's like um, it's a choice for them to choose Russian. But you know, the choice is between German and Russian, uh, French and Russian, something like this. It's a possibility like the second uh, foreign language after English. But it's very hard. I, I, sh I should be honest, it's very hard to learn uh, uh, Russian for Latvians. Because it's totally different, the uh, alphabet, sounds, how you should pronounce, and so on. Imagine for Cuban. <laughs> 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 I mean, it was mandatory. So, well, that, that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Thank you, thank you very much for, the, for your time, for being here, for listening. And I hope that it's, um, inspire, it will inspire you for some kind of uh, things to do for your country. <laughs>